Good morning, my name is Nick. I'm the high school pastor here at Arcade Church, and I get the wonderful privilege of sharing the word with you this morning. Uh, You know, I'm sure that like me, many of you are probably still a little stuffed full of turkey. Uh, Many of you probably just got to have a huge meal with family, with a bunch of people all around, uh, enjoying a Thanksgiving meal together, just like I got to go home to San Diego and and I got to hang out with my family and with my wife's family and we had a fantastic time. And we're kind of in the middle of the series about the table, right, called Meet Me at the Table. We're, We're looking at different meals in the scripture and like what God does at tables or at around food is absolutely incredible. When I, when I think about Thanksgiving and I think about food, uh, I, I just, I, I remember, it's not hard for me to remember, that I, I love food. <laughs> you know? Like, I just, I really enjoy food. I really enjoy drink. You know, I really enjoy, like, Arizona green tea. I really enjoy Dutch bros. Like, can I hear it? No? Students, where are you at? I said Dutch bros in a sermon. Come on. Yeah, there it is. Thanks. I just love food, and it's kind of a problem because, like, I'm constantly in this place where I'm like, I could lose 30 pounds, you know, and and I'm like, I'm like regularly like, man, I wish that I could just lose some weight, and so then I, so then I like make plans to lose weight, you know, and and so I'm like, oh, here's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat less junk, you know, and so, so maybe I'll drink less Dutch Bros, Uh, maybe I'll have less Arizona green tea, maybe uh, when I go to Skips, I won't get the Western, I'll get a salad, you know, and so like these are my plans, and I'm like, okay, here's what I'm gonna do, and then I'm like at Skips, and I'm like, I'm gonna get it Western with fries. And you know what? Give me a soda to go with that. And you guys know Skip, he's gonna refill that four times while I'm there, and I'm gonna drink it every single time. Even though I want to lose weight, it's like when food is in front of me, when good things to drink are in front of me, it's like impossible for me to say no to those things, and I find myself going for it every time. I find myself digging in, and I'm sure over Thanksgiving, you could feel me. You found yourself digging in more often than saying no if you're anything like me. Our story this morning actually starts long before the meal. We find it's beginning in Matthew chapter 26, but before we read that, will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you meet us at tables, that you meet us outside, that you meet us wherever we are. And we ask, Lord, that you would meet us this morning here in this place. Lord, that you would speak through me and you would prepare our hearts to hear your words brought to us. Change our hearts this morning, we pray in your name. Amen. So the Passover meal has just happened. All the disciples got together around a table, and they ate. And it was a very emotional experience. It was a very challenging meal. Everyone seems to understand that something big is going on. Jesus does the whole communion thing, and it's like, they're like, whoa, what is going on here? And he's like setting up this whole thing. He talks about someone betraying him, and everyone's like, whoa, I don't know about that. That seems sketchy. And like, there's this whole thing going on over a meal, and that's where we're going to come in in Matthew chapter 26. If I can, uh, I got nothing. (laughs) Yeah, there we go. Okay, that's where we're going to come in in Matthew chapter 26. It says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So right after the Passover meal, it's already happened. They sung a hymn together and they go out to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus says to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter is like, no, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. So they're they're hanging out and Jesus is like, hey guys, I got to tell you, something big is about to happen. And when it happens, all of you are going to fall away. Everyone's going to abandon me. Everyone's going to leave me. And it's going to be this big thing. It's going to be real sad for me. It's going to be real hard. And the disciples are like, what? I don't know about this. And I love Peter. And I love him because I think that I relate to him so well, right? It's like classic Peter. It's the open my mouth and think about it later type of Peter. 
You know, and that's why I think I relate to him so well. He's because I want so badly to be perfect, right? And I want so badly to love Jesus with everything I am. And there's so much life in Peter's boast, right? There's so much fire. There's so much pride. There's so much love. He's, Jesus is like, we're all going to fall away. And he's like, no way, Jesus. Like, even if all these guys do, I'm never going to do that, right? Like, like I'm, I love you more than these dudes. I love you more than anyone. And even if everyone runs away from you, I'm never going to do that. Never, ever. And Jesus is like, well, yeah, not really. <laughs> right? Like, you're going to deny me three times. And I love it. Peter comes back. He's like, nuh-uh. <laughs> He's like, no, uh, even if I have to die, Jesus, I will never deny you. I will never give you up. I will never forsake you. Like, and he means it from the bottom of his heart. And for the sake of time, we're not gonna, we're not gonna go to the denial. Suffice to say that when the king of the universe predicts something, it comes true. Right? And Peter, he finds himself, and to Peter's credit, like first he cuts off a guy's ear for Jesus, right? Like, so there is this moment where he's like, okay, I'm ready to die for Jesus. I'm going to cut off a dude's ear. But then a little bit later, we see Jesus. He's going through being arrested and the trials and all this stuff. And Peter's like hovering around him and he gets three different opportunities to affirm Christ. And three different times he denies Christ. On the third time, Jesus looks right at him. And we know the story. He runs away weeping. He recognizes his failure. It's very much like my constant attempts to lose weight. And I told you, I relate so well to Peter. Right? Because I, I want so badly to lose the weight. I want so badly to not eat the stuff. But when I get the opportunity to eat the stuff, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm doing it. Right? Like, I'm going for it every single time, it seems like. And that's exactly what's happening with Peter in this moment. He wants so badly to love Jesus. And I don't think his claims were lies when he said, no matter what, Jesus, I'm not going to deny you. No matter what happens, I'm not going to run away from you. His claims were absolutely true. They were the, the depths of his heart speaking, saying, this is what I believe. I love you, and I will never deny you, no matter matter what happens, but then three times, one after the other after the other, he finds himself denying Christ. And he understands in that last moment that he has denied him, not once, not twice, but three times just as Christ predicted he would. And he finds himself broken and weeping. And then, of course, Jesus dies. And then three days later, Jesus is raised from the dead. And he starts appearing to the disciples. And he's kind of doing this weird disappearing act where he'll like show up and he'll appear. And he'll be like, cool, guys, I'll see you in Galilee. And then he'll disappear. And then he'll see someone else and be like, oh, see you guys in Galilee. And then he'll disappear. And he does this a few times. And that's where we're going to pick up our story this morning in John chapter 21. It's working. Awesome. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Just thinking that doesn't like me today. They said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Now, I love this because this is so, like I said, me and Simon Peter, we're like pals. We're like the same guy, you know. And it's like Jesus is like, I'll see you in Galilee. I'll see you in Galilee. I'll see you in Galilee. And so all the disciples find themselves in Galilee, like hanging out, waiting. They don't really know what they're waiting for. They don't really know what's going on, but they know we're waiting for something. And as they're waiting, Peter's like, guys, I'm just going to sit around and wait. Like, let's go fishing. You know, it's what we do. It's back to our life. Let's do that. And so they're all like, yeah, sure, why not? And so they go fishing. And they're out there doing the fishing thing, and they're catching nothing, probably a little frustrated. And then in verse 4, it says, just the day was breaking. Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. And then Jesus says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul, in, haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And so Jesus kind of just, he shows up on the beach and he just casually repeats the miracle they did when he first met Peter. If you were to go back to when Jesus first met Peter, Peter was like in the boat. They were doing a thing. Jesus was like, hey, you guys aren't catching any fish. You should try throwing them on the other side. And they were like, yeah, whatever. And then they did that, and then they caught a whole bunch of fish, right? And so here Jesus shows up. They don't know it's Jesus. And they're like, whatever. This guy tells us we should try one more time, so we'll try one more time. And then they load, they catch this huge haul of fish, and it's like this big deal. And so then one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, this thing just, oh, there's an on button. 
Check it out. All right. And it's probably going to work now. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord, right? He's like, he remembers the fish thing. And he's like, whoa, hey, this happened before. So he says, it's the Lord. And I love it. Simon Peter, he hears that it's Jesus and he puts on his outer garment and he, she was stripped for work. And he's like, hey, and he throws himself into the sea. He's like, I'm going to go see Jesus, right? And the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. And so Peter's like, that's 100 yards. I can swim that. And he jumps in the water, like forgets the other guys. I'm sure the other guys, if they're anything like me, were like, yeah, don't worry about it, Peter. We'll, we'll do the work. It was your idea to go fishing, but whatever. We'll bring the fish back. You go see Jesus. And so he swims to see Jesus, and he shows up at Jesus' feet. The other guys are like, hey, we're going we're gonna to finish the job, and we'll get the fish there. And they find themselves on the beach with Jesus. And in verse 9 it says, When they got onto land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. And so Peter runs over and he grabs the fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And then Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and he took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. And so the, the disciples sit on the beach and they do something that had to by this time have been absolutely familiar to them. They had a meal with Jesus. And they enjoyed that meal with the, the man they saw die, with the man they thought would never be with them again. They get to sit and enjoy breakfast with him. And then verse 15, it says, oh, there's verse 14. Verse 15, it says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, oops, I know what I'm doing, guys, it's okay. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And then a third time, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. For all of his gung-ho attitude and his love for Jesus, Peter denied Jesus three times. He messed up, right? And even though he loved Jesus and he truly meant it when he cried out, if I have to die, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, he still messed up. And I, I just relate to this guy so well because I mess up all the time. Right, I mess up often, and if, if you're anything like me, you found yourself on the other side of messing up way too often, right? You found yourself in this place, you're like, I want to do this and this and this, and, and I want to live Christ-like, and I, I want to have all the fruit of the Spirit that we've just been talking about, love, joy, and peace, and all that stuff, and instead I find myself angry and yelling and, and frustrated, you know, and I, and I want to be this person that God has called me to be, and instead I find myself being this person, like the, the Peter guy who's just constantly messing up, who's just constantly failing. And so here we have Jesus and Peter, and they're sitting here, and Jesus is reminding Peter of his failure. He asked him three times, do you love me? And I'm sure Peter's thinking about the three times just recently that he denied Jesus when he's asked him three times if he loved him. And you know what's great about this passage? In this passage, we see Jesus interacting with Peter just as he is. We see Jesus interacting with a broken Peter. We see him interacting with a Peter who isn't perfect and who's messed up a lot. I think sometimes when I read like Paul, you know, I'm like, man, this guy's perfect. You know, like, like he has humility and he has everything he's supposed to have. And he's, his eyes are on Jesus and he's like, he's all there. And I forget sometimes where he came from. And in this passage, we get to see Peter where he came from. We get to see Peter broken. We get to see Peter not perfect. We get to see the Peter who denied Jesus despite his desire to follow Jesus with his whole heart and with everything he is. There's this guy named Torn Wells. He came here for a concert uh, not that long ago. It was a while ago. And he writes a song called Known. And in the song, he says that it's not one or the other. It's hard truth and ridiculous grace. 
And it's that hard truth and ridiculous grace that his song talks about that is happening here in our passage. You see, Jesus challenges Peter three times. Three times he says to him, do you love me? It's hard truth. Peter, you denied me, right? You failed. You messed up. Three times he reminds Peter of his failure. You made a promise you couldn't keep. You failed not once, not twice, but three times. The hard truth is that sin is real. It's destructive and it's hard to avoid. Right? Just like it's hard for me to avoid the green tea and it's hard for me to avoid the burger, it is hard to avoid sin. It is hard to stop doing that which I don't want to do. And even though my heart might say, man, I really, really want to, even though the spirit might be willing, the scripture says the flesh is weak. And for Peter, the hard truth was he messed up. But there's also ridiculous grace. Because Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter responds that he loves him. And then what does Jesus say? He says, feed my lambs. And then then he says, do you love me? And Peter responds. And what does he say? He said, tend my sheep. And he responds and says, what do you say? And three different times, there is this ridiculous grace that says, the hard truth is you messed up. But the ridiculous grace is that I died for you anyway. I mean, go back to that moment. Jesus told all the disciples, you're going to fall away from me. And all of them were like, no, no, we won't. We're with you all the way. And then it happened. And that third time when Jesus looked at Peter, there there could have been a moment there, right? And and man, I think if I'm in Jesus' place and my my best buddy, you know, the guy I've been been doing ministry with for three years, that I've been discipling, that I've been encouraging, that I've been teaching, that I've been feeding, that I've been hanging out with, and he denies me and he abandons me and he betrays me three times in a row, I think that third time I'm going to forget this. Why would I die for these people? All they're going to do is abandon me again. Right? Like, forget this. I'm not going to go to the cross for these guys. They don't love me enough to even say, oh, yeah, I know that guy around a campfire. Like, forget this. They all abandon me, every single one of them. Why would I die for them? But instead, what does Jesus do? He still goes to the cross. He still dies for Peter. He still creates a way for Peter to have a relationship with him forever. He still forgives Peter. And so now here after the cross on the beach, he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Here's the hard truth. You messed up, Peter. But I died for you anyway. Right? I died for you anyway. Even though you failed, even though you messed up, I died for you anyway. Anyway, you know the first line in Tornwell's song, it goes like this. It's so unusual, it's frightening. You see right through this mess inside me. Isn't that true? Man, God sees me in all of my mess, in my, in my, my Peter state, you know, when I'm, just, when I'm not doing it right, when I'm not living right, when I'm not acting right, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm making promises I can't keep, when I'm, when I'm failing, God sees me right in my mess. And then it says, you call me out. And pull me in. And, I, and that, I, I wonder if when he wrote this song, he was thinking of Peter. And he was thinking of this time on the beach where Jesus calls him out, right? Like, you messed up big time. But it's not to, it's not to condemn him, right? Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We read that in Romans chapter 8. It's not to condemn him. It's to pull him in. He calls him out, man, you messed up. But then he pulls him in. And he tells him he can start again. He says, feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. Tell people about me. And I love that line because right in my mess, right in my brokenness, right in my failure, Jesus is saying the same to me. He's calling out my brokenness and he's calling out my sin. And then he's saying, now get up and start again. He's saying things like he said to Peter where he said, feed my lambs. It's on this time. I don't know. It's not working. Can we, can, is someone back there? Can we go to the next slide? It's not working. Okay, what happens is Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Share the gospel, right? Tell the world about the truth of the gospel. Feed the lambs. The lambs, are, they're the little ones. They're the young ones, not the adults, the ones that don't know about Christ yet. And then he says to him, tend my sheep. It's, it's lead the saved, right? It's the sheep are the ones that are already, they're already grown up. They're already in the fold, right? And so it's lead the saved. 
It's help those who have already come to know Christ, help them know him more. And, and remember, Peter's the one who's going like to help start the church. And so, so he's telling them, like, I've got plans for you despite your sin, despite your failure, despite how you've messed up, despite the hard truth that sin in your life is, is broken and not good. I have plans. And you're a part of them. So get up and get moving. He tells them to start again, right? To get up and start. He calls them out. He pulls them in. And he tells them to start again. I was talking to someone recently who had some, some stuff they were struggling with. And it was, it was a real struggle kind of thing. It was really, like, I really don't want to do these things, and yet I find myself still doing them, right? And, and I really don't want to mess up here, and I find myself still messing up. And, and, man, I really want it to go away in my life, but I haven't been able to figure out how to get it to go away in my life. And, the, and they were really struggling. And in their struggle, they said to me, Nick, because I'm struggling, I think maybe I should stop doing student leadership. Or, like, I think maybe because I have this sin in my life, I should stop doing student leadership. Do you know, do you see what Jesus is doing with Peter in our passage? And I love it because he's doing it right in front of the rest of the team, right? Like all the disciples are there on that beach. And right in front of all the disciples, there's this interaction where Jesus says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You messed up. You have sin and brokenness in your life. You, Peter, are not perfect. He pointed it out very, very clearly. But each time he says, keep serving me. Keep doing what I've asked you to do. Keep doing what I've called you to do. Keep moving forward in this relationship and in what I've called you to do. There is never a moment where Jesus says, yeah, you know what, Peter, you did mess up. It's time for you to sit down. I'm done with you. He says, yeah, Peter, you did mess up. And he calls him out and he pulls him in. And then he says, get back up and start again that is what Jesus is doing. I've still died for you. I've still forgiven you. And I'm still asking you to minister to my people. In fact, in verse 18, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. And another will dress you and carry you wherever you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. He says to him, hey, Peter, remember when you said, I would even die for you? Remember that claim you made when you said, I would even die for you, Jesus? Guess what? You're going to get to do that. You're going to get to live out your original promise that no matter what happens, I won't fall away. And no matter what happens, I won't stop following you because you're going to get to die for me. So follow me. He called him out. He pulled him in. And then he told him he could start again. He said, get up. Get moving. So what? And we saw that Jesus and Peter, they have this meal on the beach. And he calls him out and he pulls him in. And what does how Jesus called out Peter and he pulled Peter in have to do with me, right? Like, like what does that have to do with us? I think first, if you and I are lost without Jesus. I mean, when Peter denied Jesus three times, he was broken. He went away crying. He finds himself fishing. He's not catching any fish. Like nothing's going right in Peter's life in our passage outside of who Jesus is. And without Christ, that's where we are. We are lost and we are broken. We're in this state of I can never do what I want to do no matter how badly I want to do it, right? Like even if I want to be good, like even if I want to be the best dad I can be, even if I want to, if I want to be kind and generous, even if I want to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control and all that stuff, even if I want to have all these things without Christ, I can't do any of it. Like there's one thing hopefully we got out of the last series. It's that without Jesus, I can't produce fruit in my life. Without Jesus, I can't have freedom. Without Jesus, I can't have life. That no matter what I want in my life without Christ, I'm not going to be able to do what he calls me to do. So if you're here this morning and you have not chosen to believe in this Savior, the one who died for us even when we didn't deserve it, the one who died for us even when we weren't doing what we were supposed to be doing, even when we weren't living according to his purpose. If you're here this morning and you have not yet chosen that, can I encourage you this morning? He's calling you out. He's saying, I recognize you're broken. I recognize you've sinned. I recognize that you keep sinning. And I died for you anyway. 
He's not calling out your sin right now to condemn you. He's calling out your sin right now to invite you into life with him. So if you're here this morning and that's where you're at, maybe you're saying, man, I've done so much bad stuff. There's no way that anyone could love me, let alone the God of the universe. And he's saying to you, I've done so much death on the cross. And there's no way the bad stuff that you've done is big enough to stop me from saving you. And he's inviting you this morning into life and relationship with him. If you're here this morning and that's where you're at, can I just encourage you? And after, after service, there's going to be some elders up here. I'm going to be wandering around. Just come talk to us. Like, let's have that conversation. Let's, let's talk about the brokenness so that we can call you out, not to condemn you, but to pull you in and to remind you that Jesus died so that you can start again. Amen. Second, should struggle with failure to follow the promises of God disqualify you from serving him? I, I think we do this thing. This thing where we go, man, I'm not good enough to serve Jesus, right? Like, like I'm not good enough to do what God calls me to do. I'm, I'm not good enough to serve. Like that, that student I met with who was like, I think I have to come off student leadership, Nick, because I have sin in my life. And I'm struggling, and I'm struggling, and I'm struggling. And guess what? I'm like, dude, you're struggling. Yes, you know? If you're struggling, this means you're trying to pursue Jesus. Praise the Lord that you're struggling with your sin. Because if you're in your sin and you don't care, we have a problem. But if you're struggling with your sin and you don't like it, then we're moving towards Christ. It's called sanctification. It's a really cool word that means I'm going from here to here. And here is where Jesus made me to be. And it's a process trying to get me there. And so if you're struggling with your sin, man, yes, praise the Lord. Keep struggling. Surround yourself with people who will help you in the struggle. Surround yourself with people who will, who will pull you along when you're struggling. Who will encourage you and pray for you and love you. But should that struggle disqualify you from ministry? Man, maybe why 100% of the church is run by 20% of the people. Maybe the reason that's true is because a large percentage of the people not serving are not serving because they have not yet understood the ridiculous grace of our God played out in their lives. Maybe there's a whole lot of people in the church who are sidelined right now. And they're sidelined because they're saying, I'm not good enough to serve in the church. I'm not good enough to do God's work. I'm not good enough to feed the sheep and tend the lambs and do all that stuff because I have all this junk in my life. And so I'm going to sit over here and I'm going to wait until I get all the junk out of my life. And then I'll get up and I'll start serving Jesus. And all along, Jesus is saying to Peter, man, if you wait to be perfect, guess what, Peter? You're never going to do anything. You're never going to succeed in the work that I've called you to do if you wait for perfection to happen. Here's a hard truth for you. You will never get the sin in your life under control because you have no control over the sin in your life. Let me say it again. You're never going to get the sin in your life under control because you have no control over the sin in your life. All we can do is run to the one who does. All we can do is go after him with our whole lives and say, Lord, I'm going to give you everything I've got. And I recognize I'm going to stumble on the way. And I recognize I'm going to make mistakes along the way. And I recognize I'm going to fail along the way. But, Lord, I'm going to come after you with everything i got. And I'm going to keep getting up. And I'm going to keep remembering that you've allowed me to start again by your grace. And that it's only through your grace that I can serve anyway. And so I'm going to get out there and I'm going to do what you've called me to do. Not waiting for perfection because I recognize that's not happening until I'm in the kingdom. I'm coming after you now with everything I've got, Lord, because I have no control over the sin in my life. And so if you've been on the sidelines waiting for sin to be dealt with before you would be willing to serve in the church, can I encourage you this morning? Sign up for something. Start serving. In your brokenness, in your failure, in your pursuit of Jesus, just start serving. Let God's people who you'll be serving alongside of be people to help you in your struggles. Let God's work be something that helps you and gives you a desire even more to get out of the sin that's in your life because you want to serve him even more. 
because you want to you want to grow in him even more. Recognize that your struggle with sin is not on you; it's on Jesus. And so, all you got to do is run after Him. There's some great stuff you can do as first steps for this. BACPs this weekend. You could start small. You can just sign up for BACP. I'm going to show up to BACP and I'm going to work an hour. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. I might be serving drinks. I might be jumping on the bounce house. I might be handing out suckers at one of the stations. I might be just wandering around greeting people. I have no idea what I'm going to do. But I'm going to sign up to serve for an hour at BACP as a, as a springboard to maybe get me started in serving in other places in Arcade Church. You know, there's this incredible ministry at Arcade Church called high school ministry. Yeah. Shameless plug, I know, and I'm not afraid of it at all. High school ministry, you can sign up to come alongside students who are also struggling to be perfect. Students who are, who are looking at how to follow Jesus and love him, and you could walk alongside them, and you could help them see how you're following Jesus. And you could share with them, here's the stuff that I'm, I, I wish I wasn't doing, <laughs> and Jesus is helping me do it less, you know? And you could come alongside them and you could serve. There's, there's a middle school ministry. There's a children's ministry. There's all sorts of places in the church where you can do God's work. And this morning he's saying to you, I've, I've called you out. Here's your sin. I've forgiven it. And I've pulled you in. And, I, and I'm telling you, go and serve me and my church. Get out and do something for the gospel and for the kingdom. And thirdly, lastly, Uh, one of the things that I, that I absolutely love about this story is how clearly it defines discipleship. Jesus models it for us, right? First, he spends time with Peter, a lot of time. Three years, in fact, of just like in-depth hanging out with Peter. And then when, when Peter messes up, it's this awesome thing where, where Jesus, after spending time with him, he uses the relational capital that he's built with Peter over the last three years. They have a relationship, and out of that relationship, he brings him to breakfast, and he says, hey, buddy, you messed up, big time. And he doesn't condemn him, he doesn't push him down, he pulls him in, and he invites him to keep loving God, to keep serving God, to keep living for him. He invites him into ministry, right? Right? And how beautiful is that? That's what discipleship is. It's spending time with someone. It's using that time that you're spending with someone to help push them to Jesus. And then it's taking the opportunities to call them out when necessary and to pull them in and to invite them into loving others. And so I would ask this question this morning. And when I ask this question, I'm tempted just to, to address the students in the room. But here's the thing. We all need this. I'm tempted to address the students because I want them to come find the leaders in our ministry and become discipled. But we all need this. So here's the question. Do you have someone in your life who will sit you down, who will call you out, and who will pull you in? Right? Is there someone in your life who will see you not living the way you're supposed to be living? who will see you doing something you shouldn't be doing? Is there someone in your life who will sit you down, who will say, hey, uh, I'll call you up and say, hey, we're going out to coffee this week, right? I wanna take you to lunch. We're gonna go play disc golf, real golf maybe. We're gonna go play some kind of golf. <laughs> we're gonna go hang out together and that will sit you down and say, hey, this thing that you're doing, you need to not be doing it, right? Not because I'm better than you, not because I'm trying to condemn you, but because I want to invite you into life with Jesus. Is there someone in your life who will call you out and pull you in? And if the answer to this question is no, go and get one. Get two, get five. Find someone who will meet with you regularly, who is not afraid to sit at your table and remind you of both the hard truths and the ridiculous grace of our God. Maybe for you, it's, just, it's going to your gather group and, and finding one of the people in your gather group to say, hey, I got some stuff I'm struggling with and I, and I just, I need someone to pray with me, to talk to me, to help me. Maybe you're not in a gather group and it's a matter of going to find a gather group so you have a whole bunch of people who you can share what's going on in your life with and who can pull you out and call you in and, and do the work of the church in your life. Go and find someone 
I mean, if you have to just wander out in that courtyard today and there's a whole bunch of people out there who are always smiling and greeting and loving people and I bet you if you went up to one of them and you said, man, I just, I just need to go to lunch with someone, I, I just need to, I, I just got some stuff, that they would happily take you to lunch. I always tell my students, you probably even get a free lunch out of it. It's good. So do it, find someone. And if you already have someone, maybe you have two or three or four people already that are speaking into your life, that are, that are willing to call you out when you need calling out, can I encourage you? Go find someone who needs that and be that for them. Go invite someone to lunch. You're buying because you wanna know what's going on in their life. You wanna come alongside them. You wanna encourage them. You wanna disciple them. You wanna be like Jesus is to Peter in their life. So find one or be one. Jesus met Peter on a beach, sin and all. He called him out most assuredly not to condemn, but to remind him clearly that he loved him enough to die for him and to save him. And in doing that, he pulled him in, calling him to live out his faith even as he gives up his struggles. And he's calling out to us this morning with hard truth and ridiculous grace. Lord, we cannot say enough how grateful we are both for the hard truths in your word and for the ridiculous grace that comes after. Lord, without your hard truth, you wouldn't be God. And without ridiculous grace, we would be lost. And so we thank you for both we ask that you would remind us of the places in, in our lives where we are not living up. And that you would call us out in those moments so you can pull us in and invite us to start again. God, help us to know who you are in and through every moment of our lives and to come running after you instead of trying to deal with our sin. Lord, knowing that only you can do that. We lift you up, we praise you, we worship you in your name. Amen. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another. That together with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. And we say together, for the glory of God. Thanks everyone, have a great one. Thanks for watching. Find out more about the Arcade Church community at arcadechurch.com.